The Tom Woods Show, episode 637. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. I got another great libertarian podcast for you. It's a podcast I've been featured on, and I liked it so much, I made it into an episode of my own show, and that's Lions of Liberty. Check it out at lionsofliberty.com. Friends, if you don't have the time of your life aboard the Contra Cruise in October 2016, then what can I say? I owe you a Coke. Bob Murphy and I are hosting a cruise that's going to be full of fun and games and music and fellowship and making new friends. A ton of fun. ContraCruise.com. Hey, everybody, what a delightful episode this one is going to be. Very, very interesting because we have a chance today to talk to Eugene Yelchin, who is an illustrator and writer of children's books. And we're going to be talking about his young adult book, Breaking Stalin's Nose, because it's a tremendous look into what life was like in Stalinist Russia. And look, I'm 43, and I read this book and was found it completely absorbing. And I'm still thinking about it. It's very, very well done. And he, it, it won a Newbery honor, which of course is a, is a very big thing. So I thought this is a definite. We definitely want to uh, talk to Eugene Yelchin if I can possibly get him on the show. And I did. Now, let me just tell you one quick thing. In the, the first answer that he gives me uh, is you'll, you'll, there's a little bit of background noise so we paused and I uh, we troubleshooted and figured out where that was coming from and got rid of it. So don't worry that that's going to be going on through the whole episode. It won't. It's just in the first response. All right. Eugene Yelchin, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Tom. I'm happy to be here. I am really happy that you're here. I don't even remember how I came across this book, where, where I read about it. Uh, it's called Breaking Stalin's Nose. I just told people about it. And it's meant for, I guess, a younger audience, but I'll tell you, I'm 43 years old, and I'm going to be thinking about this book for a long time. It, it really haunts me. The way you, and as I was telling you before we went on, I said, it's so well executed, so to speak. Uh -huh. But it, it really is, the, the main character begins with such, it's, it's almost sweet, it would be sweet naivete if it weren't in the service of such a wretched cause. But then as reality gradually settles in, well, anyway, I don't want to reveal too much because I really do want people to read it. On the other hand, you know, the, the book does refer to executions, so it's not really for a super young audience. What's the audience you have in mind for this book? Well, you know, uh, that type of book, uh, historical fiction, um, can work on several levels. Um, it is published uh, by Macmillan, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge publishing uh, house that uh, publishes for adults as well as for children. And the book intended for what they call middle grade novel, which is for kids who are in middle grade, but the path to the middle graders um, is usually through either their parents or their teachers or the librarians. And those people are usually, I don't want to generalize, but, you know, they're, they're about your age, a little younger, uh, some little older, so they're adults. So those are the people who read the book first. As a result, I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the novel can be read at many different levels, at the level of the plot, at the level of uh, ideology, at the level of history. So there is, a, there, is, uh, there is a lot to chew on for any age, actually. Well, there's no question about it. And of course, some of the younger readers might miss some of the subtleties, some of the sarcasm. I'm looking here just on page eight. I loved this. Uh, just read the one paragraph on page eight. Uh, this, is, this is told from the point of view of the main character. Stalin says that sharing our living space teaches us to think as communist we instead of capitalist I. We agree. In the morning, we often sing patriotic songs together – when we line up for the toilet. Beautiful. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, listen, this is, this is a personal experience. I mean, I, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I came to the United States when I was 27 years old. 
1983. So I came as an adult. Uh, I grew up in what was called Leningrad. Now it's St. Petersburg again. We don't know for how long. Uh, but I grew up in the communal apartment. My, my, there were five of us, and we shared a very small room with several other families. And yes, you do line up t- to the toilet in the morning because there is only one for everyone. So, so, so part of this book is, I, I, is, is per- listen, frankly, I wrote the book for myself. I, uh, it's, a, it's a very personal document uh, about, um, really about ideology and how ideology works. Uh, I, uh, you know, t- to, to survive, I guess, that's probably a right word, to survive the, the, the realities of the, uh, of the police state, uh, one, has to, one has to create a certain, I guess, walls within oneself, kind of a fortress uh, that shuts down a lot of emotions, all kinds of things, right? Um, and um, it uh, makes you a bit of a less less a human being, less human. Um, so I survived, and then I learned certain things that prevented me from staying, and I left uh, with some difficulty and started my life as an American, right? Uh, but after some years, uh, 20 maybe years, I found that that fortress, so to speak, that that emotional, psychological kind of defense mechanism, right, that you build within yourself to survive the hardship, uh, was preventing me from essentially becoming a, becoming an American, you know, becoming a free person. As a result, I had to work it out somehow, and so I decided to write, you know, to write a book. We, I did not think it would be published. I wrote it for myself just to work through that uh, dilemma. And the fact that the book went on to become, you know, I don't want to be just falsely modest, to, be, to, be, to become extraordinarily popular, it's translated in 10 languages. It won uh, the Newbery uh, Honor. Uh, it just did remarkably well. It, did, it had like 20 awards. I, nobody expected it. I, the least, expected it. And so what it tells me, it tells me that uh, there is something in that book that can speak to, um, or, or, or let's put it this way, that my experience speaks to people who live in a democracy as well. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. And there's a lot, boy, there sure is a lot in there that, I'd like to ask you about as, – as long as I've got the book open, though, I want to read one more quick passage. This is just from page 10. I've read the whole thing, but I got to page 10, and I thought, all right, I, love, I love the tone of this. This is the last paragraph on page 10 of, of, of this chapter. I take small bites of the carrot to make it last. The carrot is delicious. When hunger gnaws inside my belly – I tell myself that a future pioneer, this is a reference to the young Soviet pioneers, has to repress cravings for such unimportant matters as food. Communism is just over the horizon. Soon, there will be plenty of food for everyone. That's right. But still, it's good to have something tasty to eat now and then. I wonder what it's like in the capitalist countries. I wouldn't be surprised if children there had never even tasted a carrot. And you know what this reminds me of? I've, I've mentioned this on the show several times, that when, when the Grapes of Wrath movie was used as a propaganda film against the capitalist West, it backfired because the main, you know, the, the family, the protagonist, owned a car. That's right. They pulled it out. Yeah, it played for a little while, then they took it out. Yes, well, you know, it, it, it was uh, ideologically... It, uh, it touched people's lives on every level, you know. I, I think that uh, it's difficult to understand, perhaps, uh, that the revolution of the communist, the Bolshevik, rather, revolution of 1917, 
was not just the change of one regime to another. The program that the communists had at the time in which they continued uh, throughout uh, keeping the power is the idea was to really create a new society. And they couldn't create the new society without creating a new man, a new human being. So as a result, um, everything that, um, that preceded them was annihilated uh, by force, really. Um, and uh, the, every single institution from, um, from the government to the police to you name it, to all the way down to the uh, family. So the family as a unit, as we understand it, uh, was profoundly affected. Um, as a result, uh, even though the communist regime fell in uh, 91, I guess, um, the people who grew up under, that, under those conditions um, are still around, and they have children, and they have grandchildren. And when my book came out, when Breaking Stalin's Nose came out in Russia, which it did, uh, two years ago, it created a huge controversy. It was the first book written about Stalin and Stalinist regime for young audience. Uh, so there was a public outcry and uh, there were all kinds of interest and discussions um, because I think it hit too close to home, really. Um, when I uh, wrote the first uh, draft of it, I sent the book to several friends of my brothers, actually. They were a little bit older than I am, uh, to, to just to make sure that the narrative is authentic. And after they read it, they, one of them in particular, uh, said something to me that, and I've known this person since I was uh, born, or since I was a child, uh, told me that uh, his uh, grandmother was arrested and imprisoned in Gulag. And I had no idea. So people don't talk about their experiences out of fear. So over the 70 years of that regime, the fear that was installed in its populace is uh, so extraordinarily strong that even to read a book like this uh, was, um, for many people, very unpleasant. You note in the author's note, and this is building on something you just said, that they had to more or less invent crimes, accuse people of things that they obviously had not done as a way of keeping the entire population in a state of terror. If they simply went after people who were guilty of obvious sabotage, that'd be one thing. Most people know that they're not guilty of those things. But the idea that just about anybody could be targeted, and that's what, that, what runs through this book is this theme that the world this kid is living in just doesn't make any sense. His father is the seems like practically the greatest of the Soviets after Stalin himself, and suddenly he's arrested and taken away and not seen again. These things happen, and the 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 the, the one thing that the kid can rely on is that Comrade Stalin will be able will you know Stalin will, our great leader will put things right. He'll put things right. That's the only thing that's holding his world together. And wow, that's a very very thin read, uh, depending on the goodwill of Stalin to make your world make sense. Right. Well, that's sort of the 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 sort of the con construction of the novel is just going back a little bit to uh, when we were talking about different ages of uh, of readers. The construction of the novel is such that there is a gap there. It's written in the first person. 
uh, we uh, listen in to a boy telling us what is happening, uh, and we see as readers that he doesn't get it, that he sees what he wants to see. And so that gap grows wider and wider and wider until to s at some point he catches on. He makes a, a, he makes a pretty profound decision. Um, if you remember, he, his, his dream is to become a communist like his father. My father was a communist and was a true believer in communism and in communist party. So I grew up with that sort of ideology at home. And he makes the boy in the book makes a very, very profound decision mm. not to follow the path of his, of his father. Yet he still loves his father. Um, and there is a, the, the, you know, when I, when I, when I talk about the book to, um, to kids that sometimes I visit schools when, uh, when uh, some of the schools in the United States have the book on their curriculum. So they read it and then they have me come over and talk about it. And, uh, it's, it's just fascinating to, uh, to hear, the kids talk about the book and how they react to it. The uh, pretty much everyone <laughs> is asking me how how is it going to come out in the end? Because the the it's an open ended story, if you recall. That's right. There is really no end to it because there can't be one, right? And 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 so um, the only thing that it saves the boy in the, in the end from that very terrible, terrible world that he lives in is just a, a small act of kindness from the stranger. That's right. That's right. That, that's, a, that's a beautiful little moment in an otherwise very grim situation. I was actually wondering as I read – and then I got the answer to my question in your author's note at the end, whether there really was a, a group called Young Soviet Pioneers that young people would join. And in your note, you say, like my main character, I wanted to be a young pioneer. So there really was such a group. Oh, absolutely. No, it was – absolutely. <laughs> yes. I think there's probably still now too. I'm not sure. Absolutely. You – when you turn 10 or 11 – uh, if your grades are decent and your behavior is passable, uh, you uh, become a member of the – there were three stages, really, uh, at school. The first one is called the Young Octoberists, uh, uh, named after the October – Bolshevik October Revolution. And that's from first grade until, I believe, third grade. Uh, then from that point on, you join the Young Pioneers group. Then in high school, you join young communist group, and then you go on, and if you, know, you want to continue along those lines, you become a communist. So there were all three at school, from uh, low grades through high school, there are three stages of ideological education uh, through those, uh, through those all-nation uh, groups. Yeah, they were all over the country. It was part of our schooling. All right, so then let me ask you from your own experience. In the book, the character, the main character at the beginning is extremely enthusiastic about the prospect of becoming a young pioneer. He just can't wait for that moment, and his father's going to be so proud, and it'll be great. And incidentally, when we discover, we have a hint of what happened to his mother, but how chilling it is to really find out what happened to his mother. But anyway, his father's going to be so proud. In your experience, was there more cynicism among the young people about what it meant to be a young pioneer? Uh, I think it depends. Uh it's difficult for me to say it was a while ago. I think that maybe maybe passivity is the right word. You know, I grew up, I was his age in 1960s. 
Um, so uh, it was uh, Khrushchev, what the prime uh, minister, uh, but not the prime minister, what, uh, whatever, uh, secretary of the Communist Party, who um, then it was Brezhnev and you know, things were, I, I'm lucky to uh, to grow up under Brezhnev because at least he didn't kill, uh, uh, he didn't kill that many. He probably killed some people, but he didn't kill at the level of Stalin, of course. Millions and millions and millions of people were exterminated. Uh, so it's just uh, something that uh, you, you don't question. You know, you just, uh, go alone and just trying to survive and try to make the best of everything on one hand. On the other hand, and I think it's an important issue, is that um, also one can't uh, forget that it was a closed country. Uh, there was no information practically coming from abroad. So your set of references is very narrow. And if your brother and your sister and everyone you know joins the pioneers, that's how things are. I want to ask you about um, – because at the end, you, again, in your author's note, you say that these crimes that we associate with the great terror under Stalin are crimes that – were taking place uh, in secret and people didn't discuss them and so on. Uh, there, there was, of course, and, and that, and so in the 1960s, you say a lot of people were not even aware that the crimes had occurred. Yet there was the famous Khrushchev speech in 1956 that kicked off the so-called de-Stalinization process, in which he did say that terrible, terrible things had occurred during that time. Were people aware of at least that 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 it was now allowable to be somewhat critical? Of what had happened under Stalin? Or was it allowable to be critical? Well, uh, that's why I think it's called secret speech, because it wasn't, you know, published in the first uh, pages of magazines and newspapers. I mean, it was delivered at a closed party congress. Uh, it was distributed to local governments. Um, I think uh, they shared it with some uh, universities I don't believe it. I don't know. I can't tell. Ah, so okay. So the general public doesn't really know this is going. So in other words, maybe the speech is so that the rest of the uh, bureaucracy administration knows that probably the chances that you have to worry about the knock on the door at one in the morning, uh, those have been diminished. They were certainly diminished. Uh, I I, th I think what happened really is that. Um, well, you know how, uh, just imagine this, if in 1945, instead of having the Nuremberg trial, we would have all those people who uh, ruled the uh, Nazi Germany and were responsible for the crimes against humanity, uh, were, instead of uh, being punished, um, that they would be allowed to run the new democratic Germany. Well, the same thing happened in the Soviet Union, you know, and it happened over and over again. When Stalin died and Khrushchev took power, the secret speech was really a, a strategic move to take control over the uh, to take control over the government because the opposing group within the party. Uh, was pro-Stalinist. And so to overthrow them, um, he dared this thing uh, that really uh, caused only one, uh, in my, you know, I'm not a historian, I can't tell, but the only un one positive thing was, yes, there were no people killed, there were no people arrested on the scale that was before, but what happened is that it was forgotten that the crimes against humanity that Stalin had committed was swept under the carpet. Um, that happened under Khrushchev, that happened under, that happened under uh, Brezhnev, and it happened subsequently. And now, as a result, it all is coming back in a much more positive light. Stalin now is, uh, you know, a great manager who won World War II and uh, brought the country out of chaos into the world power. He's a good person. I'd like to talk now about your own personal decision to leave the Soviet Union and the circumstances that led up to that decision. But before we do that, let's hear a word from our sponsor. 
Folks, I've been a guest on a lot of podcasts, but some podcast interviews, well, I just pretend they never happened. But when I was on Lions of Liberty with Mark Clare, I had such a great time because he's such a smooth and skilled interviewer who brings out really, really interesting responses in his guests that I thought, I need my whole audience to hear this episode. So I made it into an episode of my own show. Lions of Liberty at lionsofliberty.com is an excellent libertarian podcast. Mark does interviews, roundtables. He's got a brand new podcast, The Weekly Felony Friday, that focuses on the broken criminal justice system. And he just had Ron Paul on for episode 200. Lions of Liberty is 100% Tom Woods endorsed. I love Mark Clare. I love what he does. And I'm sure you will too. Check it out at lionsofliberty.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. That's lionsofliberty.com. You said in the uh, book that both you and the main character of this book both had a life-changing decision that you made. I mean, the, the main character, of course, turns away from communism. He's not so excited about being a young pioneer anymore. And then you yourself had to make the decision to leave the country of your birth. And I'm curious to know what led up to that. First of all, what had you been doing for a living? I know you've been a, an illustrator and a painter, and you've done some children's books, and you've written this book. What had you been doing for work when you were there, first of all? I was working in a theater. I was a theater designer. Uh, I went to a very good school uh, uh, in St. Petersburg, where I grew up. Uh, my mother worked for a ballet school there, for, you know, Leningrad Ballet School, which is probably, some claim, the best in the world. I think it is. And I kind of grew up backstage. And um, as a result, I went to a theater school there uh, and, uh, and was designing. I designed about 40 shows. Well, no, 40, probably too many. A uh, bunch of shows all over the country in St. Petersburg, and then with friends of mine from the same uh, year, uh, graduates from our school, we went to Siberia to a city called Tomsk, and we started a theater company for children, and we worked there for a while, and I think if I didn't leave uh, St. Petersburg and didn't go to Siberia, maybe I... Uh, maybe the decision wouldn't be as easy one. But after I lived there for a couple of years and I saw what that country really was, and after I learned what I've learned through reading um, books that were banned, and if you were caught with a book like that, you would most certainly go to prison. Um, I just couldn't... Uh, I felt that to, to stay there is to be part of that really terrible crime against uh, against humanity. But that means that you were able to see through all the propaganda, because I'm sure in school you were told that this was for your own good and for the good of Soviet society that these subversive ideas were being kept from you. Somehow, you, I guess you didn't buy that. Well, no, I absolutely did buy that, and I bought it for a very long time. Um, I think that the first kind of glimpse occurred when I was already a teenager. Um, you know, I started reading books and I met people when I started working in a theater. It was just a little bit more kind of, uh, there were more intellectuals, more creative people. They were a little bit more liberated. Um, it, you know, it depends how open you are to, to, to this, uh, to this visions of, of something different, of something that's liberating and free. And, you know, I was interested in Western culture. I was interested in music and movies. You know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a, you know, for us, a lot of very good friends of mine, very creative, intelligent people are still there working. I, I couldn't imagine that. Did you come to the United States in – I'm trying to figure this out from the math that I've gleaned here. Is it the late 70s or early 80s, sometime around then? 83. And how easy was it to just up and leave the Soviet Union in 83? No, it was not easy. It was very hard. It took me a long time. Yeah. Okay. So what would be – what are the obstacles? I mean, how are they keeping you in? Uh, well, well, how did they keep us in? I don't think they let anybody – they were letting – uh, people of uh, uh, they were letting Jews out. 
Yeah, I remember starting around 74, they did that. Yeah, there was like a big sort of move towards, uh, you know, Reagan did a lot on that and Carter. I mean, there was a lot of work done. Um, then they sort of stopped and they started again. It was, uh, it was kind of touch and go. Um, my father died in uh, 1972 and he really opposed immigration. Yeah. Uh, even though we were Jewish, but he just, he was too adamant. He felt that it was wrong, that you can't leave your country. He was just, uh, you know, it's interesting because I think my dad was, and in a way, this book is dedicated to my father. So uh, he is on my mind. Yeah. Uh, I, I think he was a very typical Soviet, see, that new person. Of, of which I spoke earlier, that, that they tried to create this new civilization. He was uh, extraordinarily intelligent, uh, a great reader, a, a lover of poetry. Um, he certainly saw the difference between what, what he was told and what actually the, the actual reality was. Uh, but I think he believed in the program. He believed in the party to a degree that the party could do no wrong, that he was working for the party. And if the party says, you die, he would have died. And, 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 and a great deal of people who were arrested and tortured and executed they uh, allow it not escape, not try to escape, but allow for it to happen and denounce each other, not because they were bad people or they, because they were terrified. They were, of course, terrified. But they also did it in the name of the party, in the name of Stalin, because they truly believed in that ideology. I hope you won't think this too personal, but it sure sounds to me like the relationship that the boy in the story has with his father, in which the boy eventually moves away from communism but never stops loving his father, sounds a bit like your relationship with your own father. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. That's, that's the most difficult thing is to, is to, you know, and I think that every teenager goes through that period when he or she breaks away from her parents and, and becomes a human being and becomes whoever that person is going to be. So um, if it involves a break in ideology, the, the rift is so much more dramatic. It's very difficult. And I, the, the last several years of his life were very difficult for both of us because obviously he loved me very much. Uh, obviously, I admired him greatly, but we had very different take on, uh, on the question of truth, I guess. Tell me about when you came to the U.S. I'm really curious. I would find it just frightening beyond all measure to go to a brand new country and have to fit in and not have employment lined up and so on. But I'm just curious to know, what were your first impressions of the U.S. when you came here? Was there anything that surprised you? Oh, yes. Uh, well, just to, uh, just, to, uh, uh, just to say that the first two weeks, two, three weeks in the United States – were probably and the happiest time of my life. The, the, the sense of kind of liberation, a lightness of being, the sense of freedom, um, I don't think I can recapture, even if I want to. Uh, the, 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 the difference was so dramatic. The contrast was so enormous. It was like coming to a different planet in every way, in every way. And I was very open. Um, I, didn't re I didn't know English, uh, so it was kind of, you know, I didn't really understand anything. Uh, but I liked everything, and it was just fascinating. I went to Boston. I uh, had a friend who lived there, and I had a place on the floor in the living room, and, you know, I started doing this work. And I had, just before I left, I, I had a pretty significant art exhibit at the museum uh, with my theater designs, 
And then, you know, a month later, I was in uh, Cambridge Square in Boston giving away flyers for like a burger joint, you know, and smiling at everybody. I didn't care. I was happy and free. That's a beautiful story. That's, oh, that's, that's, re- that's true. That's true. That's true. I tell you, you know, I say this to people uh, and people don't believe me. When I came here and I saw, you know, uh, you know, I went to New York. I had a friend in New York and I wanted to see Manhattan and I went to all different kind of places. And for the first time, uh, really, I saw people, homeless people. I saw people who, uh, you know, lived on the streets because uh, in Russia it wasn't at the time. We had no homeless people. Um, so the way those homeless people walked their gait, right, had more self-confidence and pride in who they were than anybody I saw walking on the streets of Moscow and Leningrad. Wow, that's – have you ever been back? Oh, no. Oh, I'm not the type. No, I can't. That, that chapter of your life is closed. Uh, it's, it's too painful. It's I'm, – I'm, you know, pain, probably not the word. I'm angrier at them than I ever was. Uh, I, and I tell you why. Because my access to information when, while I was living there – was very limited. Only, as I said, only books that were underground books or uh, books that were smuggled into the country. And so it was very, it was scary. It was very dangerous. And uh, if you get a book, you read it for a day and then you have to give it away. It was just tough. Of course, here I have enormous access to information. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, a great deal of information from the archives uh, for a couple of years it was allowed to be glimpsed by some of the historians from the West and so many many books came out and as I'm reading and studying and I've read a great deal for when I was writing the book and when I wrote my subsequent books um, I'm it's overwhelming that people still people of conscious still choose to live there. What are you working on these days? Uh, well, I have uh, all kinds of things. Uh, after Breaking Stalin's Nose came out, um, it won a Newbery Prize. And so um, it allowed me to continue writing. Uh, I wrote a book called Arkady's Goal. Uh, and it's a look at a Right, right in again, it's in the Soviet Union, right before World War II uh, in uh, 1941. And it's a story about a, a very different kind of boy who uh, is an orphan and he's in the, um, he's in an orphanage for the, what they call for the children of the enemies of the people. And then he's, it's, it's really a soccer book. He's a soccer player, the boy. Uh, then this June, uh, my third novel is coming out. It's called uh, The Haunting of Falcon House. And it takes place in St. Petersburg at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and it's sort of a ghost story on the surface, but underneath it, it's really a story, like all of my books, it's a story about, you know, freedom and slavery. Uh, it's a book about impossibility of, I guess, uh, impossibility of being free while slavery exists. Because you inadvertently become a uh, part of enslaving someone. It's a t- two boys, one one is an aristocrat, a prince, and another boy is a, is a, is a serf, right? A peasant, a slave. But um, it's just think between them. Uh, and uh, now I'm finishing, kind of in the process of finishing a book about, it's a spy book. Uh, it's called Spy Runner. Uh, and it takes place during the, it's 1953 in the United States, uh, during the um, uh, kind of anti-communist um, 
campaign, McCarthy and Hoover, and it has to do with Russian spies and stuff like that. So that's where I'm at. Well, it sounds great. I, I was just at EugeneYelchin.com, and we're going to link. You know that? Yeah, go ahead. It's Eugene Yelchin Books. You, you have two. You have EugeneYelchin.com. I saw some. I saw some of your art. Yeah, that's just paintings because I'm a painter and an artist, and I illustrate books, and I also work in the movies. So I have a bunch of different websites. But in terms of books, it's Eugene Yelchin Books. Right. So I clicked on books and I went over to eugeneyelchinbooks.com. So I'm going to link to both of those at uh, tomwoods.com slash 637. So I just saw the cover of The Haunting of Falcon House. So it, it looks very good. I did not realize until this moment just how many books you'd written. You've been a busy guy. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, there are books for kids. You know, they're a little bit shorter than adult novels. So yes, certainly. Well, I'm I'm just look. I'm I'm glad everything worked out for you. That's what, I'm glad you got out. I'm glad that uh, you felt enriched when you got here. That you had that extraordinary feeling and experience, and that you wrote this book because I I just love it. And I'm trying to think of a way to. I, I have I have an almost 13 year old, but she's very very uh, easily affected by violent themes or not like there's a lot of violence in the book but there it's it's a little disturbing just how awful that regime was and i'm wondering about having her read it or not yeah but there's no violence in the book there is a, there is it's hinted at but you're right there is no violence no for kids they don't they 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 don't they don't really feel it i mean what they feel is i think that um the desire for the boy to reunite with his father I think yeah. I think that's what they're, where their hearts are. Oh, and I bet also they have this feeling of what would it be like to be sitting in that classroom and you knew that you're guilty of the crime. I know. And you don't know who knows. <laughs> it's I a know. tough situation. I know. I know. It's very dramatic. Yeah. All right. Anyway, great. Thanks so much for your time. I'm going to link to all of it on our show notes page and, and try and drive you some traffic. And best of luck with the new books uh, when they come out. Thank you so much, Tom. All right, we got a really juicy episode also coming up tomorrow. I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute. But I want to tell you about a new website started up by another Tom Wood Show listener, and that's danielpakala.com. Pakala is spelled P A K K A L A. Danielpakala.com. There you will find the philosophy of liberty applied not just to current events and U.S. politics, but also to areas where Daniel himself has professional experience, which includes things like investment strategies, economics, and personal development techniques. He's going to be adding a weekly podcast there. Very interesting stuff, stuff we're all interested in, we could all stand to learn more about. You'll very much enjoy checking out danielpakala.com. I'm going to link to it as the listener website mentioned for today at tomwoods.com slash 637. Remember, you too can get a shout out for your not yet created website or blog. Check out tomwoods.com slash publicity and find out also how you can get a whole bunch of free goodies from me as well. Uh, but the directions on how to do that, you got to do it before you start your blog. Uh, they're all to be found at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, I will be welcoming back to the show Peter Wallison, and we're going to talk about the whole question of the financial crisis from the point of view of deregulation. We hear this all the time. Deregulation is to blame for the financial crisis, and there are two pieces of deregulation in particular that are singled out as the culprits, the primary culprits. We're going to look at both of them and see if there is anything to this story. So that's going to be a lot of fun, very interesting, and very important tomorrow, so make sure and tune in. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.